This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week we honor the year in music for 2001 along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2001. We also look at the case for putting the specials into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame isn't a hall per se, it's the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in Washington, D.C. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2001. In music, on September 7, 2001, Michael Jackson held the first of his two 30th anniversary star-studded tribute concerts at Madison Square Garden in New York City. That same day, singer Ryan Adams recorded a music video for his song, New York, New York. In the video, Ryan stood on the Brooklyn side of the East River with the skyline of Lower Manhattan behind him. Among the buildings of the skyline were the twin towers of the World Trade Center. On September 10th that year, while testifying in front of Congress about $3.2 trillion in missing defense money, U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld called the Pentagon bureaucracy the biggest threat to America. On the evening of September 10th, Michael Jackson performed the second of those 30th anniversary tribute concerts at Madison Square Garden, less than a couple miles away from the World Trade Center. The morning of September 11, 2001 started out as a pretty, relatively warm, sunny day in New York City and also in Washington, D.C. There were new album releases that day from Jay-Z, Mariah Carey, and Bob Dylan. Singer-actor and writer Seth MacFarlane of Family Guy fame and rapper and actor Marky Mark Wahlberg were both scheduled to be on flights out of Boston, Massachusetts, going to Los Angeles, California that morning, but both of them missed their flights. Those flights were the planes that went into the World Trade Center, the first one at 8.46 a.m. By the time the morning had ended, four airplanes were hijacked and crashed in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania, and almost 3,000 people lost their lives. MTV and VH1 stopped playing music videos and instead played news reports from CBS News. The Latin Grammy Awards, which were scheduled, were canceled. Sting, who was beginning an internet live stream when the attack started, only played one song, his song Fragile, and then cut the stream. After the events of that day, the new century would be marked in the human consciousness by before 9-11, and after 9-11. On September 18th of that year, the anthrax terror campaign started as letters were mailed containing the deadly chemical to various news organizations and congressmen. 22 people came in contact with anthrax. Five died as a result, including postal employees who handled the letters. For years, the person who the FBI said was the prime suspect was bioweapons expert Stephen Hatfill, However, after finally being exonerated in 2005, the FBI turned their attention to scientist and new chief suspect, Bruce Edwards Ivins. Ivins committed suicide in 2007. The FBI named Ivins as the main suspect in 2008 and closed the case officially in 2010. All of the attacks added to the mounting fear and uneasiness in the country. In fact, Things got so crazy that the group Anthrax had to put out a statement saying that they weren't going to change their name just because people wanted them to. Musically concerning all of the attacks, Clear Channel Communications, one of the largest radio station owners and now better known as iHeartRadio, gave their stations a list of songs that they highly suggested should not be played. Among them were Knockin' on Heaven's Door, both the Guns N' Roses cover version and the Bob Dylan original version, Drowning Pool's Bodies, and every single song from Rage Against the Machine, 
which the band took as a badge of honor. A lot of songs were written about September 11th, including the Beastie Boys' An Open Letter to New York City, Beyonce's I Was There, Mary Chapin Carpenter's Grand Central Station, Alan Jackson's Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning, and two songs from Sheryl Crow on her album Detours. Bruce Springsteen put out an entire album about the attacks called The Rising. There was also a charity concert held in New York City for the attack's victims. Among the acts who performed were The Who, David Bowie, and Jay-Z. The person who helped to organize the event? The man who, along with Bill Cosby, helped to jumpstart the hashtag MeToo movement. Former Miramax CEO and now convicted sexual predator Harvey Weinstein. In fact, there were at least five megastar charity concerts to benefit the victims of 9-11. Surprisingly, very few minority artists, aside from Jay-Z and Michael Jackson, were invited to perform at these charity concerts. There was, however, an all-Latino charity concert called Hispanos Unidos por New York that was held on December 9th that year. Artists like Sheryl Crow and the Dave Matthews bands either changed the songs that they were releasing around that time period, pulled certain songs off of upcoming albums or changed album covers for upcoming releases because of the uh, anthrax attacks and also the 9-11 attacks. The other huge world-changing music story of 2001 was one that no one at the time realized the impact that it would have, and it wouldn't even come from a musical artist. On January 9, 2001, Apple CEO Steve Jobs announced the iTunes Media Player. On October 23rd of that year, Apple released the first iPod. After those two events, music was never the same, for better or for worse, your choice. Other musical events of 2001 included a crowd that crushed and killed a woman during Limp Bizkit's performance at the Sydney, Australia Big Day Out Festival. Michael Jackson was found not guilty of plagiarizing an Italian songwriter's song. Sean Combs was found not guilty of the events surrounding a nightclub shooting in New York City that happened back in 1999. Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown trashed their hotel room at the Bel Air Hotel and both were arrested because of it, along with being being banned from the hotel for life. Whitney also signed a six-album, $100 million record deal with Arista Records. Mariah Carey, not to be outdone, signed a four-album, $80 million record deal with Virgin Records. Mariah also entered treatment for mental health issues after having a series of mental health breakdowns, including an infamous appearance on the MTV show Total Request Live. Country music legend Charlie Pride released a tribute to Jim Reeves, which was the first compact disc to have copy protection embedded into it, making it extremely difficult to copy the disc for personal use. Copy protection became a trend until MP3s completely took over music. MP3 file sharer Napster closed down after being forced to by court injunctions. By then, though, despite the music industry's better efforts, the genie had already been sprung from the bottle and MP3s became the music vehicle of choice until streaming services cut into song and album sales in the next decade. Also in 2001, XM Satellite Radio started. Bands that formed in 2001 included Andion, Arcade Fire, Audio Slave, The Black Keys, Dance Nation, Dirty Vegas, The Dresden Dolls, Fall Out Boy, Gabrielle and Dresden, Jet, The Killers, LCD Sound System, The Modern, Nemesis, The Postal Service, Scissor Sisters, Vinny Vici, Seville, Sneaky Sound System, and My Chemical Romance, whose lead singer, Gerard Way, was inspired to follow his dreams and start the band after witnessing the 9-11 New York City attacks firsthand as he was crossing New York Harbor in a ferry that day. Mel C. quit the Spice Girls in 2001. Jason Newstead quit Metallica. Wes Borland left Limp Bizkit. Mike Turner left Our Lady Peace, Don Felder was fired from the Eagles, Eric Singer replaced Peter Criss as drummer of KISS. 
bands that either broke up before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included All Saints, The Afghan Wigs, Aqua, Babes in Toyland, Breathe, Damn Yankees, Deep Blue Something, Elastica, Groove Theory, James, L7, N17, Orbit, Republica, Savage Garden, Semisonic, Skunk Anansi, Sun Volt, TKO, Total, Tilt, The Toadies, Twisted Sister, Escape, and Electric Light Orchestra, better known as ELO, who then reformed later in the year without original member Jeff Lynne. Other groups that reformed in 2001 or came back from their hiatus included Level 42, The Monkees, Maroon 5, Roxy Music, and Sunny Day Real Estate. Jennifer Lopez became the first female artist to have a number one album and a number one movie that she starred in during the same exact week when her album J-Lo and her movie The Wedding Planner both hit number one that week. Billboard's biggest selling album of the year, though, was Linkin Park's Hybrid Theory. Other big sellers were from Shaggy, InSync, Janet Jackson, Enya, Stained, Alicia Keys, Destiny's Child, Creed, Gorillaz, Aerosmith, the O oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack, and the Now That's What I Call Music Volume 6 compilation album. Janet Jackson's song All For You was added to three major mainstream radio formats in its first week of release, becoming the first song to ever do that. Billboard's biggest selling song of 2001, however, was Lifehouse's Hanging By A Moment. Other big songs were Fallen from Alicia Keys, Drops of Jupiter by Train, I'm Real from Jennifer Lopez and Ja Rule, If You're Gone from Matchbox 20, let Me Blow Your Mind from Eve and Gwen Stefani. Thank You from Dido. Again from Lenny Kravitz. Independent Women from Destiny's Child. And No Doubt's Hella Good. Heavy Metal was still breathing, although it had fully transformed into rap rock and pop punk with bands like Linkin Park, P.O.D. and Some 41 chopping the charts. Big bands like Nickelback, Aerosmith, Entombed, Drowning Pool, Guar, Tool, System of a Down, Slipknot, Slayer, Judas Priest, Megadeth, and Avenged Sevenfold all put out albums that year as well. In country music, some of the biggest albums of the year were Leanne Rimes' I Need You, Lone Star's I'm Already There, Trisha Yearwood's Inside Out, Toby Keith's Pull My Chain, Garth Brooks' Scarecrow, George Strait's The Road Less Traveled, Tim McGraw's Set This Circus Down, Brooks and Dunn's Steers and Stripes, and Greatest Hits albums from Martina McBride and Reba McIntyre. Best-selling country songs included Toby Keith's You Shouldn't Kiss Me Like This, I'm Just Talking About Tonight, and I Want to Talk About Me. Also, Alan Jackson's Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning, his 9-11 tribute song, and Where I Come From. Brooks and Dunn's is only in America and ain't nothing about you. Jamie O'Neill's There Is No Arizona and also When I Think About Angels. Lone Stars I'm Already There and also Tell Her. Kenny Chesney's Don't Happen Twice. Diamond Rio's One More Day. Tim McGraw's Angry All the Time and also Grown Men Don't Cry. And the Dixie Chicks, now known simply as the Chicks' song, Without You. In hip-hop, the biggest albums of the year included DMX's The Great Depression, Tupac's Until the End of Time, Jay-Z's The Blueprint, which came out on 9-11. D12's Devil's Night, Ja Rule's Pain is Love, Nas's Stillmatic, Lil Bow Wow's Doggy Bag, Ludacris's Word of Mouth, Juvenile's Project English, and Jada Kiss's Kiss the Game Goodbye. Big singles included Outkast, Ms. Jackson, and also So Fresh and So Clean, Clean, Nelly's Ride With Me, E.I., and Number One, Jay-Z's Izzo and Girls, 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 Trick Daddy's I'm a Thug, D12's Purple Pills, Missy Misdemeanor Elliott's Get Your Freak On, Eric Sermon's Music, Ludacris's Area Codes, Fabulous's Can't Deny It, and Nas's Uchi Wally. In dance music, BPM became the first dance channel on Sirius XM, which launched that year. 
Despite England having a serious foot and mouth disease, insert your own joke about British politics there, the country still held its heavy slate of music festivals. Among the albums that were released in 2001, well, there was Tiesto's first solo album, In My Memory, also Paul Van Dyke's The Politics of Dancing, Daft Punk's Discovery, Jamiroquai's A Funk Odyssey, and Ministry of Sounds' The Chill Out Session. Big EDM singles included Roy De Silva and Cassandra's Touch Me, Daft Punk's Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, Roger Sanchez's Another Chance, Tiesto's remix of Delirium and Sarah McLaughlin's song Silence, Io and Nadia Ali's Rapture, Faithless's We Come One, Andy C's Body Rock, Lasko's Something, Armin Van Buren's The Sound of Goodbye, Paul Van Dyke's We Are Alive, Dirty Vegas's Days Go By, which became huge after being used in a car commercial that year, Basement Jax's Where's Your Head At, Fatboy Slims's Song for Shelter and also Weapon of Choice, and the Chemical Brothers' It Began in Africa and Star Guitar. The top 10 DJs on DJ Mags's Top 100 DJs poll for the year were John Digweed, Sasha, Danny Teneglia, Paul Van Dyke, Paul Oakenfold, Tiesto, Carl Cox, Mauro Picotto, Steve Lawler, and Deep Dish. Latin artists who had big 2001s included Paulina Rubio, Vicente Fernandez, A.B. Quintanilla, E. Los Cumbia Kings, Lupio Rivera, Azul Azul, Grupo Brindis, Luis Miguel, Marco Antonio Solis, Christian Castro, M.D.O., Jackie Velasquez, Cheyenne, Palomo, and crossover artists Ricky Martin and Christina Aguilera, who both put out Latin albums that year. Musical films and documentaries that came out in 2001 included Beijing Rocks, Glitter, Carmen, a hip opera, Hedwig and the Angry Itch, Moulin Rouge, Rockstar, and Scratch. Musicals and a revival of musicals that opened on Broadway included Mamma Mia, 42nd Street, You're in Town, and The Producers, which was a smash pop culture hit, much like Hamilton was in the mid-2010s. Artists who were born in 2001 included Billie Eilish, Zach Heron of Why Don't We, Carson Luders, and Lil TJ. Singer Ilea was killed in a plane crash in 2001 when her small plane was overloaded with gear from a music video she was shooting in the Bahamas, and then the plane crashed shortly after takeoff from all of the weight. Other artists who passed away in 2001 included George Harrison, John Lee Hooker, Chet Atkins, John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, Joey Ramone of the Ramones, Perry Como, Les Brown of Les Brown and his Band of Renown, Melanie Thornton of La Bouche, Spanish rapper Quevedo, composer John Fahey, violinist Isaac Stern, Stuart Adamson of Big Country, Kenny Green of Intro, drummer Billy Higgins, harmonica player Larry Adler, trombonist J.J. Johnson, and Chuck Schulender of Death. In award ceremonies for the music of 2001, at the Grammy Awards, the O oh Brother Where Art Thou movie soundtrack won Album of the Year. Also, Alicia Keys won Song of the Year for Fallen and also Best New Artist. U2 won Record of the Year for Walk On. Janet Jackson won MTV's first Icon Award at the Video Music Awards. The video for the song Lady Marmalade by Christina Aguilera, Lil' Kim, Maya, and Pink won Video of the Year, though, that year. That ceremony was also the one with Britney Spears' famous Snake Charmer performance to her song I'm a Slave for You. At the American Music Awards, Luther Vandross, Alia, Charday, Enrique Iglesias, Brooks and Dunn, Faith Hill, Lenny Kravitz, Janet Jackson, InSync, Tim McGraw, and Limp Bizkit were the big winners. At the Billboard Music Awards, Destiny's Child won Artist of the Year. Alicia Keys won Entertainer of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Faith Hill, Garth Brooks, and InSync won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. 
At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Copenhagen, Denmark that year, Tanel Pater, Dave Benton, and the group 2XL from Estonia won for the song Everybody, making Dave Benton the first black person to ever win at Eurovision. Tim McGraw won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and the Dixie Chicks, now of course known as the Chicks, won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Dido won Best British Album for No Angel, and S Club 7 won Best Song for Don't Stop Moving at the Brit Awards. Diana Krall won Artist of the Year and also won Best Album of the Year for The Look of Love, while Nickelback won Best Song for How You Remind Me at the Juno Awards. Powderfinger won Album of the Year for Odyssey No. 5 and also won Single of the Year for My Happiness at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, the producers won Best Musical, winning 12 Tony Awards out of 15 nominations. 42nd Street won Best Revival of a Musical. The Pulitzer Prize for Music was won by John Corigliano for Symphony No. 2. Musically at the Academy Awards, Randy Newman won Best Song for If I Didn't Have You from the movie Monsters, Inc., and Howard Shore won Best Original Score for The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Rings. P.J. Harvey won the Mercury Music Prize for the album Stories from the City, Stories from the Sea. The 2001 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on March 19th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inducted guitarist James Burton and pianist Johnny Johnson into the Sidemen category. Island Records founder Chris Blackwell was inducted into the non-performers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted Aerosmith, Solomon Burke, The Flamingos, Paul Simon, Richie Valens, Steely Dan, Queen, and this next artist. Before we get to today's inductee, let's give some context to his background and what drove him. The Jackson 5 was formed in Gary, Indiana. It consisted of brothers Jackie, Tito, Jermaine, Marlon, and their little brother Michael, who was born on August 29, 1958. Their father, Joe, had a dream of being a professional boxer, but put that aside in order to support his family, taking a job as a crane operator in the Gary, Indiana area. Joe also had dreams of being a musician. He started a band called the Falcons with his younger brother Luther and their friend Pookie Hudson, but the band broke up. Hudson then started his own group, which became the doo-wop group, the Spaniels, who had the hit song Goodnight, Sweetheart, Goodnight. As with a lot of parents who had dreams that didn't work out for one reason or another, Joe pushed his musical dreams onto his sons. He was an extreme taskmaster who would make the brothers practice for hours on end in order to hone their craft. To some people, his behavior with his family bordered on abuse. These days, that would get you at least a visit from child services. But this was the 1960s, so no. The J5, as they're sometimes called, started playing talent shows and then started doing theater shows like Harlem's Apollo Theater. It was at the Apollo that Gladys Knight first heard them and sent their demo tape to Motown Records, where their tape was rejected. They were assigned instead to a small label called Steeltown Records. The J5 recorded the songs Big Boy and We Don't Have to Be Over 21 to Fall in Love with Steeltown. They performed as the opening act for the group Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's at the Regal Theater in Chicago, Illinois. And Bobby was so impressed with them that he arranged for the J5 to get a second shot with Motown Records. He set up an audition where this time president and owner Barry Gordy was there to listen to their audition and to actually check out their audition tape afterwards. But again, Motown turned them down. At that time, they did not want a young act since they already had a young act. It was a teenager by the name of Little Stevie Wonder. You may have heard of him. However, after thinking about it for a little while, Motown decided to take a chance and signed the group to a recording contract. 
1969, they recorded and released their full-length debut album called Diana Ross Presents the Jackson 5. Fellow Motown artist Diana had become the group's caretaker of sorts for Motown in order to get the group acclimated to the Motown assembly line way of doing things and to also get them some extra publicity by being associated with her. That album had one release, but it was a big one. It was their number one smash single, I Want You Back. In the next six years, they put out 14 albums for Motown Records, including a live album, a Christmas album, a soundtrack album, and a 1971 Greatest Hits album, which was the first album that I ever bought that wasn't considered a kid's album like Sesame Street, just for the record. Moving Violation was actually the last studio album that they put out on the Motown label. They also released 17 singles that hit the Billboard Top 100s chart. And out of those 17 songs for Motown, their first four singles hit number one, and they had three others that hit number two. The group had hits on Motown like ABC, I Want You Back, Stop the Love You Save, I'll Be There, Mama's Pearl, Never Can Say Goodbye, Maybe Tomorrow, Dancing Machine, Going Back to Indiana, and Sugar Daddy. They also became teen idols with a TV variety show which introduced their sister Janet to America and a Saturday morning cartoon show. In 1976, the group left Motown for Epic Records. Jermaine Jackson left the group and stayed with Motown, having a pretty decent solo career for its time. The Jackson 5 became the Jacksons and put out six albums. They had 13 more singles that hit the Billboard Top 100 singles chart, with three of those hitting the top 10. Of course, during that time, they also had their lead singer, Michael, break out and have a Hall of Fame solo career. Michael had actually started his solo career while the Jackson 5 were still at Motown. His first solo album was 1972's Got to Be There. He followed that up with Ben later that year. The title track for that album was also the theme song for the movie Ben about a boy and his rat and how all the rats attacked and killed people. Cozy little movie. It also had a reboot with Crispin Glover in the past decade or so. Anyway, Michael's theme song won a Golden Globe Award for Best Song and was also nominated for an Academy Award. He followed that album with 1973's Music and Me and 1975's Forever Michael. He next went and worked on the movie version of the Broadway musical The Wiz, which starred Diana Ross as Dorothy. The musical director for The Wiz was Quincy Jones, and Quincy Jones and Michael hit it off and decided to work together on Michael's next solo album. That album was recorded between December 1978 and June 1979 in Los Angeles. Michael wrote three songs, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, Working Day and Night, and Get on the Floor. Rod Temperton, who used to be in the band Heat Wave, wrote Off the Wall and Burn This Disco Out. Stevie Wonder, of little Stevie Wonder fame, wrote I Can't Help It. Carol Bayer Sager and David Foster wrote It's the Falling in Love, and Paul McCartney wrote Girlfriend. She's Out of My Life was written by Tom Baylor, who wrote the song in 1976. For that song, Michael spent the time learning the words instead of reading them while he was recording the song. The song affected him while he was singing it so much that he started crying. Quincy decided to leave the crying in the final edit of the song. The album Off the Wall was released on August 10, 1979. There were five singles that were released off the album. Don't Stop Till You Get Enough and Rock With You both hit number one on the Billboard singles chart, while Off the Wall and She's Out of My Life hit the top ten. The fifth song released was Girlfriend. As for the album, it became the third biggest album of 1980 and was nominated for only two Grammy Awards, winning one. After that success, the Jacksons, with Michael, released Triumph, which had the hits Heartbreak Hotel and Lovely One. Although Michael's solo album, Off the Wall, had sold over 20 million copies worldwide and had spawned those hits, the album did not get Album of the Year at the Grammys. Michael was upset. In fact, he was so upset he vowed that his next album would be bigger and also more respected by the Grammy Awards. What's more, he had also tried to get on magazine covers, but Rolling Stone magazine famously declined to do a story on him. As he told someone afterwards, quote, 
I've been told over and over that black people on the cover of magazines don't sell copies. Just wait. Someday those magazines are going to be begging me for an interview. Maybe I'll give them one. Maybe I won't. End quote. With all this in mind, Michael went to work on his new album. He recruited Quincy Jones to produce this album as well. They recorded 30 songs, agreeing to nine of them for the album. He got songwriter Rod Temperton to help write a few songs, including Thriller, got horror film master Vincent Price to do the voice towards the end of that song, which Vincent actually pulled off in only two takes. He recruited the members of the group Toto to play on songs like Beat It, had Eddie Van Halen do a guitar solo, and got Paul McCartney to duet on a song. And when all was said and done, both Michael and Quincy listened to the album and hated it. They then spent the next two months stripping down the songs and remixing them. Finally, on November 30th, 1982, Michael released the album Thriller. At first, it did okay. The Girl Is Mine with Paul McCartney was the lead single and went top 10. The next single, Billy Jean, had a little intrigue, some infighting, and also a little history to go with it. The song itself was written by Michael. The song tells the story of a woman who accuses a man of being the father of her child. According to Michael, the song is not about one woman, but about a bunch of women who accused his brothers of fathering their children back when he and his family went out on tour. According to a few other reports, the song is actually about one crazed fan in particular who accused Michael of fathering one of her twins. Don't ask me how that's actually possible. Then, after sending him crazed letter after crazed letter, sent him a letter with a gun, telling him to kill himself at a certain time because if they couldn't be together in life, then they would be together in death, right after she killed their baby. Thankfully, that didn't happen. The woman was found and ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Quincy Jones didn't like the song at first and didn't think it belonged on the album. He didn't like the opening at all. Michael wouldn't change it, though. Michael wanted co-producing credit for the song because, according to Michael, the actual song was pretty close to the demo that Michael had made. Quincy said, absolutely not. Not gonna happen. Their arguing actually got to the point where they didn't even talk to each other for a week. Another thing about the song was what they called sonic personality which is when you hear the first few seconds of a song and you automatically know exactly which song it is and who did the song. Since the first few seconds of Billie Jean are actually drums, that meant doing something different. They built a special drum platform and a few other tricks to get that unique drum sound that you hear in the beginning and you automatically know what song it is the second the drums kick in. There were two other things that helped make this song and album historic. The first was the music video. Directed by Steve Barron, MTV refused to play the video as they were, quote, a classic rock and roll station, end quote, which was actually their way of saying that we don't put black people on our channel. Michael's record label at the time had their president, Walter Yetnikoff, famously threatened to pull every music video off of MTV unless they played Michael's video. When that record label was CBS, the biggest record label in the world at that time, that threat carried an awful lot of weight. MTV relented and played the video for Billie Jean. Good choice as it helped both make the song and MTV extremely popular. The second thing that made the song so popular was a TV special. The Motown 25 special was recorded on March 25th, 1983 in Pasadena, California. No one knew it at the time, but one performance during that special would end up electrifying the world. The special itself was actually pretty good. A lot of Motown greats were there, Stevie Wonder, of little Stevie Wonder fame. Marvin Gaye, Junior Walker, Mary Wells, and Martha Reeves were there. The night had a lot of reunions. Diana Ross performed with the Supremes for the first time in quite some time. Smokey Robinson performed with the Miracles, and Michael and his brothers got back together for a performance. The Jacksons performed a medley of their biggest Motown hits, and then they all left the stage except for Michael. 
Michael then performed Billie Jean, which was the only non-Motown song performed that night, as he was on Epic Records at that time. About midway through the song, he spun around, slid backwards, and spun three times. The crowd went wild, for they had just seen Michael Jackson perform the moonwalk for the very first time to Billie Jean. Now, to be fair, the moonwalk was not exactly a new dance. People had been doing versions of it for years. In fact, if you watch old videos of 80s b-boy breakdancers, they did what was known as sidestepping. Michael actually learned how to do the moonwalk from two dancers who had done it on the TV show Soul Train. He just took it to a whole other level and did his version of it. At the time this special was recorded, his album Thriller had been out for just about five months and was still doing okay but not spectacular on the pop charts. Billie Jean was finally getting some airplay on MTV, but it wasn't a huge smash quite yet. Also, there was no internet to speak of at that time and no social media, so word had not gotten out about Michael's performance. That all changed on May 16, 1983, when the Motown special premiered on NBC television. Before that night, Michael was a popular artist with a bunch of hits and his brothers, the Jackson 5, uh, and also a few solo hits. After that night, all anyone could talk about was Michael's performance and especially the moonwalk. Billie Jean quickly flew up the charts to number one where it stayed for four weeks. And that was then followed by the song and music video for Beat It, which also flew up the charts to number one. The combination of Billie Jean and Beat It suddenly made MTV must-see television and turned the network into a pop culture phenomenon. As for Michael, it's hard to really describe how huge he became. Um, I'll try it this way. Take the craziness over Justin Bieber, BTS, NSYNC, Taylor Swift, Blackpink, and virtually every other teen obsession and combine them. And you still won't get close to the craziness that surrounded Michael Jackson. If you don't believe me, check out some of the footage from that era on YouTube, especially some of his live videos. The man literally had thousands of people outside every hotel that he stayed at. They had to close off streets just so the guy could get from place to place, and he had to have police escorts all the time. As for the album, it started selling over a million copies a week, went to number one, and stayed there for almost half a year, only to be interrupted in that run a few times by other albums like Prince's Purple Rain soundtrack before going right back to number one. Michael received a lot of critical acclaim, along with eight Grammy Awards, including that elusive Album of the Year Grammy. It's been certified to have sold over 34 million copies in America, making it the second biggest selling album of all time in America behind the Eagles' Greatest Hits album. But it also has claimed sales of 67 million copies worldwide. It is still to this day selling almost 100,000 copies a week worldwide and is still considered the biggest selling album worldwide by far. And since album sales are no longer the way people purchase their music, that record will probably stand for generations to come. Oh, uh, about those magazines that wouldn't put him on the cover. Rolling Stone came begging for him to do an interview with them, even though they had only given Thriller four out of five stars in their initial review. Michael thought about it, and then he granted them the interview, but only if they put him on the cover. They obliged, with that issue of him on the cover becoming their biggest selling issue in a very long time. So much for black people not being able to sell covers. Even though Michael did not want to get back together with his brothers, his family talked him into it, so they released the album Victory in 1984 and then went out on the Victory Tour with Michael, which was a financial disaster due to mismanagement, but not due to popularity as ticket sales were very brisk. After that, though, Michael was officially done with the group, and he went out to make the albums Bad and Dangerous, along with becoming fodder for the tabloids with rumors about him buying the elephant man's bones and sleeping in a hypobaric chamber, and an awful lot of controversy which garnered him the nickname Wacko Jacko. 
I think by the New York Post, if memory serves. There were also two cases in the criminal justice system on child molestation charges, including one felony case that he was acquitted of, at least in the criminal court system. Not necessarily in the court of public opinion, though. Of course, after that came even more controversy, culminating in his early death on June 25th, 2009, from propofol intoxication due to the negligence of his doctor, Dr. Conrad Murray, for which Dr. Murray served two years out of his four-year sentence for involuntary manslaughter. There was also an HBO documentary that trashed what was left of Michael's reputation, but that's a story for a whole other time. Michael Jackson released 10 studio albums while he was alive, along with five soundtrack albums, 35 compilation albums, 10 video albums, seven reissues, four box sets, and seven remix albums. Of those, 10 hit the top 10, including seven, which hit number one. He also released 67 singles. Of those, 30 hit the top 10, including 15, which hit number one. He sold over 400 million copies of his singles and albums. He's won 13 Grammy Awards, 5 Billboard Music Awards, 6 Brit Awards, 24 American Music Awards, and also holds 26 Guinness Book of World Records. Yet, despite all of that, When he became eligible for induction as a solo artist for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997, the Hall overlooked him, finally putting him in a few years after the first year eligibility. Presented for induction by the group in sync, the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001 and We have a selection of his music on this week's playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcast, the Music History Today podcast, where we go over the events, music releases, births, and passings for that day in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops each and every day, including on the weekends, on this channel, the Music History Today Network, and also on our Music History Today Network YouTube page. Now, back to the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we're going to take a look at putting the 1980s group, The Specials, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As we normally do at this time, to the tale of the tape we go. The Specials release nine studio albums, six live albums, five EPs, and ten compilation albums. Of those, two hit the top 100 albums charts in America, their highest being their 1979 debut album at number 84. Their follow-up, 1980's More Specials, hit number 98. In the UK, different story. Eight albums hit the top 40, with six hitting the top 10, including three hitting number one. They also released 25 singles. Of those, three hit the top 100 in America, the highest being 1998's It's You at number 29. In the UK, eight hit the top 40 with seven of those hitting the top 10, including 1980's iconic song Ghost Town hitting number one. Even though the group were not that well-known to American radio stations, they were well-known to people who watched MTV when it first started, as the music video for Ghost Town was plastered all over the fledgling channel. The group combined ska, punk, and rock steady music, along with 60s rude boy fashion and a political message, and helped to become one of the 1980s cult groups that rode the British New Wave invasion. They not only influenced fellow ska punk group, The English Beat, but also spun off their own group, Fun Boy 3. And for their early 1980s influence to other bands, and also other genres, I might add, the specials should at least be considered for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and to prove it, we have put their music onto this week's playlist. The link, as always, is in the show notes. Each 
week in this spot, we highlight a different musical Hall of Fame or museum since there's a bunch more than just the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's, for instance, the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Blues Hall of Fame, the Grammy Museum, among many, many others. But this time, though, we're going to talk about one that isn't a hall, per se, anyway. However, to me, it's probably the most important. The Library of Congress, aside from being the place in the movies All the President's Men and National Treasure, is the nation's library. Established in April of 1800, it has more than 38 million books, 14 million photographs, 70 million manuscripts, and 5.5 million maps. From a musical standpoint, it's important for a couple of reasons. The first is that it has over 8 million pieces of sheet music and over 3.5 million recordings. The second and more important reason is what it does with certain recordings. Since the passage of the National Recording Preservation Act of 2000, the library has developed a registry to preserve and protect certain pieces of music and other recordings that are considered historically relevant. That's pretty high honor when you think about it. Knowing that your song or album is so important to the nation that it needs to be preserved forever. This is a pretty high class list you're joining here. Some of these recordings are actually speeches or radio shows from yesteryear. For instance, the earliest recorded version of Abbott and Costello's famous Who's on First comedy sketch, also Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech are all in the registry, as are the first recordings on cylinders that Thomas Edison used to show off the phonograph at an exhibition. The first official class was in 2002. There were 50 recordings that were declared important that year. All of the above-mentioned recordings were in that first class. John Newton was born in 1725 in England. His parents were religious and his mother had intended for him to become a clergyman. However, she passed away from tuberculosis when he was six. His father remarried, but since he was a sailor, he wasn't around a whole lot. That left his stepmother to do what a lot of step-parents do. She shipped John off to boarding school. Boarding school didn't actually take with John, though, so he eventually ended up becoming a sailor apprentice on the same ship as his father. He was not what one would consider to be a model sailor. John was always getting into trouble and always flirting with death. And every time, he would say that he would change and then just go right back to doing stupid stuff. Much like people who get too drunk and as they throw up over a toilet, they pray to God for the pain to stop and swear that they'll never drink again until the next weekend. In any event, John's issues made even his dad angry. So he was sent to the one place where it was hoped that he would change his ways. John was sent to join the Royal Navy. Um, that really didn't take either. In fact, he deserted in order to get with a woman he fell in love with named Polly. Once people found out that he deserted, which was extremely frowned upon back then, he had arrangements made to get transferred to a slave trading ship. On his first slave trading ship, John was so insubordinate towards his captain that he was chained on the ship like the slaves his ship was carrying, and he ended up in Sierra Leone, Africa, where he was put into forced labor on a plantation. Yep, the guy working on a slave trading ship ended up a slave himself. John ended up writing letters to his father to help get him out of the jam, which actually worked. And John ended up on the ship, the Greyhound. In 1748, the ship was off the coast of Ireland when a really violent storm hit the ship. At one point during this storm, John was at one part of the ship with a crewmate directly behind him. John moved from one spot with the crewmate moving with him. At that moment, a giant wave came over the ship where John literally just was no more than a few seconds before and swept his crewmate overboard, killing him. 
Things got so bad for the ship that John and another crew member tied themselves to the slave ship so that they wouldn't get swept overboard. As he was doing this, he said to the captain, quote, If this will not do, then Lord have mercy upon us. End quote. Then, John took control of the ship's wheel for almost half a day, steering it. During his time trying to steer the ship through a torrential storm, he thought about life, specifically his life, and all of the times that he had almost died. He wondered if he was worthy, truly worthy, of God's love, or if he should even find redemption, considering how poorly he treated religious people and through them, God. If he could just get through this storm. Well, the ship finally made it through and ended up in Ireland. John decided to marry that woman he deserted the Royal Navy for, Polly, and set up captaining slave ships. That's right, kids. The writer of the most recognizable hymn in the world was a slave ship captain. For the record, by the way, he never actually renounced as a sin because, well, it was the 1700s and people back then still thought that slavery was cool and not sinful at all. In any event, he ended up doing it until he hit the age of 30, when the vigor of sea life finally caught up with him, not actually his conscious for helping to put black people into slavery or anything like that. Be that as it may, John and Polly settled down in Liverpool, England, where John started working with the Church of England, through whom he became the assistant to a parish priest in Olney, Buckinghamshire. He met a writer named William Cowper, who had also converted to Christianity, and together they wrote church verses and school plans for the Sunday school kids. John started writing hymns because it was part of the gig. In 1772, he wrote this now famous hymn, Amazing Grace. History has it that it was first used at a church prayer meeting in 1773, but there was no music to it. In 1779, John and William published it as part of a manuscript called the Olney Hymns. The song it eventually was put to was an old English song called New Britain, and that happened in the late 1840s. Of course, Amazing Grace has been recorded and covered a ton of times. We will stick with the version that makes the registry, and also a popular version based on the one that made the registry. It was the late 1960s. Folk singer Judy Collins was watching a civil rights march in Mississippi and saw how emotional people got when they heard and sang the song. She decided to record the song for her 1970 album, Wales and Nightingales. She recorded it as a way to soothe her own soul because at the time, the world in general, and her world specifically, was in immense turmoil. The civil rights movement raged on through the decades. Political assassinations ran rampant, and the Vietnam War at that time seemed never-ending. Plus, Judy was trying to recover from alcoholism herself, Apparently, this version of the song struck a chord with a lot of people because it ended up at number 15 on the Billboard Singles Chart. Judy Collins' version is the version that made the National Recording Registry. Her version isn't the one on the biggest selling singles of all time list, though. A version based specifically on her version is, and it's by a group that you would never, ever think of as a chart-topping band. The Royal Scots Dragoon Guards have been around since 1971. They're a part of the Scottish 51st Infantry Brigade. They have a pipe and drum military band. And in 1972, they recorded a version of Amazing Grace with bagpipes and horn backing up the bagpipes. For some reason, this version of the song became a worldwide smash, even beating out Judy Collins' version, which it was based on. The Scots version ended up selling over 7 million physical copies worldwide, but not without some controversy. Apparently, bagpipes are bagpipes, and military bands are military bands, and never the twain shall meet. 
At least that's according to the Scottish Brigade, who summoned the Pipe Major of the Royal Dragoons and made him apologize for what they saw as demeaning. Not the military band, mind you, but the bagpipes. Yes, the bagpipes. That instrument that's the fingernail scratching a chalkboard of the music world, if not actually done properly. And combining bagpipes with a military band was considered blasphemous, at least according to the Scottish Brigade. However, performing a song written by a slave ship captain? Well, that was cool. Go figure. So you see, a deeply religious song was written by a slave ship captain. Its most popular version was done by an instrument involved in a musical scandal of sorts. And the version that was put into the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry was a version that has ties to the 1960s civil rights movement. Don't you just love music history? Amazing Grace, as performed by Judy Collins, inducted into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry, Class of 2016, and we have put both the Judy Collins and Royal Dragoon Scottish Brigade versions onto this week's playlist, the link to which is, of course, in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. Music